So um, we'd like to welcome you to this session on place, narrative, and performance, religious education, and the cultivation of ecological consciousness. Um, we'll each introduce ourselves here quickly. My name is Jennifer Ayers, and I teach at Candler School of Theology and Emory University. And it's my pleasure to introduce my colleagues, Bert and Barbara, but I will allow them to in introduce themselves. Barbara, you go first. My name is Barbara. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bonn. I'm originally from Austria, now living in Germany. Yeah, that's me, Bert, Bert Ruben from Belgium, living in Belgium, teaching at the University of Bonn, Chair of Religious Education. Good to see you all. Great that you're there. Beautiful. Hi. <laughs> Familiar faces. Beautiful. It's really nice to see you all. Um, so Beth asked if we might um, share some of our um, ongoing research here at this year's REA meeting. And we, of course, imagined that we might be in a post-pandemic face-to-face um, -face gathering. And alas, we are not. <laughs> um, but we are still eager to share um, this research with you and to invite you into a little piece of it. Uh, you might have read on our description of what we plan to do today, our assumption that um, the cultivation of ecological concern is a profoundly local project. It is dependent on developing a strong sense of place and commitment. The climate crisis, however, is of course a profoundly global challenge, dependent on international cooperation and understanding. Bert, Barbara, and I are engaged in this transnational collaborative research project, trying to develop a link between place-based local ecological practice and global cooperation for ecological change. In the project, we hypothesize that place-based pedagogy when coupled with practices of pilgrimage, of storytelling, and of community formation in digital space, can play a role in cultivating locally grounded and globally responsive ecological consciousness. One of the pieces of our research project is the development of a course which will be taught at both Emory and at Bonn, which would incorporate all of these identity shaping practices, attention to and reflection upon local places of formation, a shared pilgrimage, which we plan for the Camino, and then a transnational class, which would be hosted in digital space, in which the students share their personal stories with each other and with a broader audience through digital media. And so today, um, we're sort of inviting you into a little mini pilot version of that course. And, um, and we wanna invite you to help us think together about some of the pedagogical and epistemological theories and practices that scaffold this project. To begin, um, we are gonna start with an activity and we um, shared with you a little bit in advance about what that will be, but I'll rehearse that in just a second. But first I want to talk just for a minute about place. Um, in my most recent book, Inhabitants, one of the chapters is on place-based pedagogy, which assumes that um, learning happens and formation happens in particular places, and that education to draw on that identity shaping power needs to both be attentive to it in the moment, but also um, help learners reflect on how places have shaped who they are. And so that's part of why we invited you to share in, in your Zoom name where you're logging in from today and um, what places you consider to be home. So how do those places shape you? And um, there are lots of scholars or theologians or um, pedagogical theorists who wrestle with place. And um, those are sort of key figures in the conversation. Some of them that would be really familiar to you would be people like Wendell Berry or Bell Hooks. But we can't all be Wendell Berry or even Bell Hooks in the ways in which they are rooted to a particular place and are able to make a long-term commitment to be in that particular place. 
global flows of migration and the increasingly globalized society in which we relate to multiple places even at once make this sort of um, rooted sense of place more challenging than it might um, have been in the past. And in fact, um, inhabitants, um, in one of the reviews of that book, there was a critique of it saying that um, the practices in that book um, really focused on local places in a way that made it difficult to imagine how the book might contribute to the formation of ecological consciousness for a global movement. And um, as much as it stings to receive <laughs> critical reviews of your work, I think that's exactly right. I think that there is sort of a gap between these kind of very localized place-based pedagogical practices and the need for a global movement. And so our project is trying to address that gap. Um, one scholar that I've been reading is Mitchell Thomaschel, who argues that a sense of place is still important, that our feelings of rootedness and stability in a world of dynamic change can be a real resource um, for, for the movement. However, hyper-local senses of place, he says, must be enhanced by what he described as, describes as constructive connectivity an awareness and cultivation of social and ecological networks. And so that's one sort of theoretical expansion of um, the role place can play in this that we'd like to play with today. And so here to our activity. Um, in advance of this session, you were encouraged to locate photos or a map or other artifacts representing three places of significance in your environmental biographies. These might be places in which you've lived or visited that have formed you socially, ecologically, and personally. If you didn't bring anything with you, that's no problem at all. Um, just take a moment now to quickly bring to mind or jot down a brief description of such a place, a place that is formative for you socially, personally, ecologically. In a moment, you'll be placed in a group with two or three other participants. Please choose one of the sites that's represented in your images, maps, or artifacts. You'll each have about five minutes to share with your group a brief response to this prompt, which I'm going to place in the chat in just a second. And the prompt is this. This place is significant because what happened to me here was. This place is significant because what happened to me here was. And you can interpret that as um, abstractly or as concretely as you would like. During these next 20 minutes, I will send messages which will appear in your Zoom windows, letting you know when it's time to move to the next person so that everyone gets a chance to share for about five minutes. After you've all had a chance to share, you'll then be invited to identify points of connection between your environmental biographies. They might be shared places, they might be similar stories or experiences or themes that you hear resonating across your stories. Things that might weave you, weave you together across our geographical boundaries. So before I put you in groups, um, everybody feel comfortable with the instructions? I was just going to ask, we we just share one place for this, correct? So for the purposes of this exercise, um, I know it's hard because we asked you to bring more than one, but um, just think about the one that's calling to you most clearly now. And if there's time, you can fold in the others, but, um, but really focus on one place and then bring in others as time allows. Okay. All right. So here I'm putting in the chat the prompt for how you might frame your little mini story. And um, we now will send you into breakout rooms. So welcome back. Um, and I wanna talk just for a few minutes about story. And then um, Barbara and Bert will talk some about, um, now I see there's a person on the beach and that is really distracting and lovely. So, <laughs> um, is that Eileen? Oh, so happy for you. <laughs> um, you wanted us to emphasize place. 
but, I thought well, I'd share you, it with yes. all of you. You have done it. That's wonderful. Um, so I will talk just a, a few minutes about narrative and then Barbara will talk a little bit more about pilgrimage and then Barrett will talk about some of his research and performance and how all these things sort of intersect and we'll conclude with some um, large group discussions. Of course, as you need, please feel free to get up and move around, um, relocate to the beach, whatever it is that will um, enable you to stay present and healthy during these next uh, few minutes. So about story, I just had the wonderful experience of talking to Mary some about her own experience of teaching around themes of story, especially digital storytelling. And um, it reminded me that, in fact, um, I believe it was 12 years ago where um, I first encountered storytelling as a pedagogical practice. On a personal level, I've been seeking this kind of practical education on how to tell good stories and how to use this practice in education. Um, it was at my very first, I think, REA meeting where Mary had organized a pre-meeting workshop on digital storytelling. And then during the pandemic, I actually took an online course from Second City Theater on storytelling for a live audience. And certainly our field is not short on narrative theories of religious education. Of course, Tom Groom has argued that it is in reflecting upon and interpreting our own lives in light of the larger Christian story, capital S, that Christian faith is nurtured. And Wimberley's landmark book, Soul Stories, proposes a practice of story linking whereby participants in small groups link their personal stories, not only with the Christian story as told through scriptures, but also with the heritage stories of African-American ancestors. In so doing, Wimberley's contributions to a narrative religious education thus expands the catalog of stories that connect us to one another. Earlier today, I was with some of you in the session entitled The Stories We Embody Pedagogical Formation and Legacy Bearing. And we heard and saw in that session a series of beautiful stories that illustrated both the power of those connections in the formation of faith and pedagogical vocation and the power of such stories to transcend time and generation. Importantly, however, hearing such stories also serves to build connections among us as we hear them. And this is where I'd like to say just a little bit more on the practice and pedagogical power of hearing stories, especially as it relates to the cultivation of ecological consciousness, of loving concern for the places that are deeply embedded, that are, that are not deeply embedded in our own memories or understandings of ourselves. So how do we learn to care for places that might seem quite far away from us, either um, emotionally or geographically? First, as I mentioned before, and here I'm going to show you a couple of um, book covers. Um, let's see. Oops. So as I mentioned before, um, sorry, that's not going to work. I have to, I have to show it to you that way so I can see my notes. Um, Mitchell Thomas Show argues that environmental learning that is up to the task of fueling a global ecolo ecological transformation must nurture what he calls a constructive connectivity. So let me say a little bit more about what he means by that. He argues that constructive connectivity promotes learning that enhances an understanding of social and ecological networks, so it's relational. It demonstrates the relationship between the social and the ecological, and it promotes creativity and innovation by building relationships among diverse clusters. So in some ways, that was what you were just doing in your small groups. You were sort of building little mini networks of stories of, of uh, connectivity between your story and your neighbor's story. He argues that we need practices that help build these networks with both humans and with the more than human world, our ecological context. One way that we do this is through sharing and hearing stories, a process that he argues should he quote should be a collaborative effort 
What are the ways that our shared experiences are shared and different? This is an educational plea for the necessity of both multi-generational and multicultural exposure. You can't know the world, he says, just by knowing yourself. The most interesting learning opportunities, he says, unfold from your personal experiences, especially when they are shared with others. So that's from To Know the World. So why story, stories? It is in part, and you all know this, so I don't need to rehearse this too much. It is in part because human brains are um, evolutionarily predisposed to story thinking. This is Kendall Haven's language relying on stories for at least 100,000 years. Haven has reviewed research across 15 fields from neural biology and cognitive science to anthropology and organization theory. He's interviewed or surveyed 1300 practitioners on the power of story and processes of learning. And I need to say that I am brand new to this part of the conversation, this part on the science of how story works in our brains. Um, the ways in which stories support learning in the here, but a few things from the research stand out that I just want to name quickly. First, stories improve comprehension and retention. Of course, we know that, but they also help hearers make meaning as they relate the story to what they already know. Stories also create motivation and enthusiasm for learning, and they also create involvement and a sense of community using story to communicate shared meaning, encouraging members to share stories, building a set of common stories. These are all related to community building. When I facilitated a more extended version of the place-based story sharing practice that you just did, I've asked students to draw a circle on a large sheet of paper, placing a couple of words in their circle that represent their story. As each participant then shares a new story, I invited them to connect the stories visually, drawing a line maybe, showing how one person's story relates to another. I think this kind of visual representation of a network maybe is a way in which we can expand these very locally based, place-based stories into a broader geographical network. Sharing stories is an emotional and intellectual practice that expands our conceptions of place. It helps us to see our particular places in a broader ecological landscape. Such stories also remind us that identity is formed even in movement from one place to another. In this movement is a kind of embodied ecological learning alongside the emotional learning that um, surfaces in telling such stories. And so now on this theme of embodied learning, I wanna invite Barbara to discuss another practice with us, traveling together to an unfamiliar place, pilgrimage. Barbara. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to take you through a brief input into my and our research thoughts and observations on pilgrimage. And we do this in three steps. So step one is the starting point. Why do we think there is a need for new forms of religious learning experiences, such as pilgrimage? We then take a short look uh, at international knowledge knowledge transfer on pilgrimage, where I briefly present a study from Glasgow, Scotland, and then move on to our project of the University of Bonn uh, in Germany, Spiritex. And then step three, I'll point out some observations from Spiritex on pilgrimage. This is still a work in progress uh, research. So our starting point, religious education and religious teacher education face the challenges of a transforming world. The requirement for prospective teachers of religion are demanding. So teachers define themselves in their professional practice, walking a kind of tightrope act. They have to authentically reconcile the role of a teacher who is expected to be a person of information about religion, faith, and spirituality. So the obje objective dimension and the role of a private person, which may collide with the concerns and perceptions of the church, the intersubjective uh, dimension. The essential thing is not to get lost 
in this tension, but to make the role your own through your own story in order to then embody it authentically. I would subsume this ability as groundedness. The basic requirement for this demanding task lies in the development of one's own religious spiritual identity, which we find, however, students, when they have decided to study to become teachers, increasingly rarely already have. On the contrary, religious spiritual education for example, in the form of rooted Christian socialization has gone from being a certainty for prospective teachers of, of RE. We find that it can no longer be assumed that they can fall back on a classical so-called religious socialization. This is also an observation Australian professor for RE, Richard Rymarsh, shares. So I think we're globally connected in this issue. A central role in the context of the study program must therefore be the reflection of the RE students in the awareness, development, and also in, in the transformation of their own religious identity. And this process needs to be accompanied. We see pilgrimage as an appropriate performative concept that can support and accompany prospective teachers of religion in the um, unfolding of their personal spiritual competence. But how can the category of pilgrimage be made fruitful uh, for RE? teacher education. In order to clarify this or try to clarify this, I'll briefly present two differently designed uh, research projects in European context in step two. So um, firstly, I would like to mention a study that was conducted at the University of Glasgow, Scotland. The purpose of the study was to identify the value of pilgrimage as an element of faith formation for Catholic initial teacher education students. And it was done through a survey of religion students who have participated in pilgrimage, pilgrimages to, um, to Rome and Lourdes. As a result, the researchers postulated six dimensions of pilgrimage in the context of initial teacher education students. First, the participants affirmation or reaffirmation of their faith. Then second, the positive experience of the social environment, this meaning the, the aspect of pi the pilgrimage community, a certain way of belonging and a shared drive. Third uh, was the strong role of peer group learning. Fourth, uh, a diverse range of triggers for a specifically personal religious experience. Then fifth, they looked at what, yeah, what, what happened after the pilgrimage. So was there that there was an application, implementation, and also some sort of change after returning. And six, the last uh, point was they pointed out experiencing and living faith in public and central sites of the Christian tradition. Secondly, and here comes my PhD and most of the time also hard project, uh, Spirit Text. The acronym stands for uh, Sacred Spaces, Rituals and Texts in European Teacher Education. And well, Spirit Text is our project at uh, University of Bonn. And we were happy to also have Jennifer be part of the fourth round uh, one month ago, which took place in Ireland. So pilgrimage is a core element 
of this international project, whose empirical analysis is still a work in progress and my work. Uh, in 2018, we visited Flanders, which is Bert's home region. In 2019, Prague in Czech Republic. In 2021, it took place as an online version. I will come to that a little bit later. And this year we met in Dublin, Ireland. The starting point and also the subject of the research project are students of religious teacher education. Students in their very different or, e or even in their lack of religious knowledge and socializ socializations. So the project couples pilgrimage and religious teacher education by connecting the performative process of pilgrimage with substantial sources of faith, sacred spaces, rituals, and texts, which is, we find, a unique way of offering uh, religious and spiritual experiences to students of RE. In the performative engagement with religious sources, uh, powerful learning environments are made possible and opportunities for immersion in religious sources emerge. This means setting out together as a group. Our latest FIDEX included, for example, RE students from Germany, Austria, and Ireland. At the same time, it means being on the road together, learning from each other and from new places in a different context. Also engaging in conversation, about how spiritualities can be shaped. The core element of the project trip is to discover the very own identity in open appreciation of each other and all voices are equal. A transformation of source to resource is to take place. So one's own experience in encountering and engaging with sac sacred places, rituals, and texts is translated as a resource for professional as well as personal life. Regarding connectivity, I would uh, like to briefly mention the online version again. So 2021 took place as an online spirit text. Back then, the group was divided in couples of two, of two and two, and uh, who either lived nearby and met for impulse-guided pilgrimages, or they walked their very own path together, connected via telephone. So this included talking about Bible texts and what they triggered in each person, but also periods of silence that were nevertheless shared, even though they were walking alone in their uh, surroundings. It was honestly very exciting to see how a project that consists very much of learning in the presence of each other can work even in times of social distancing. Although no final results can be presented yet, I, uh, with regards to the means of pilgrimage, the following observations can be elaborated, which brings us to step three. And again, uh, the empirical analysis is still a work in progress. So pilgrimage functions as a process of slowification. And through this slowing down, the pilgrim's gaze and intention is sharpened, which at the same time widens the participants' focus, both on their surroundings and on their innermost being. So this means uh, in the walking, there's an opening of the mind which then allows a special form of open encounter at eye level and exchange within the group. Pilgrimage is able to, uh, to bridge the gap between the space for both 
personal existential introspection and the community. The community aspect, uh, such as um, the connection to the group or a very deep exchange with fellow pilgrims. Moreover, in both studies, the consistently positive effect of the abolition of hierarchical structures of accompaniment in pilgrimage is marked as belonging to the very, very successful elements of pilgrimage. pilgrimage. I should maybe mention that there were not only students, but also their teachers present at pilgrimage, at the pilgrimage. So um, these thoughts about hierarchical structures show great parallels also with the reflections of Turner and Turner in 1978. We can call it now meeting on equal terrain. We close the link, uh, performativity with embodiment. Pilgrimage is a process that comprises the inside and the outside of the individual in in other words, the mental exploration goes hand in hand with a certain physical challenge. And one shouldn't underestimate that, I think. When we look at pilgrimage in particular connection with the physical activity, I want to emphasize the interaction between the physical feeling and the spiritual experience. I would describe it as a circle. The mind drives the body on the one hand and it is stimulated by physical movement on the other. Nina Grabe, a researcher from Switzerland, uses the image of, quote, praying with one's feet for that. For the participants walking, um, Walking the pilgrimage path means that they have, the, they have to relocate themselves, detached from the familiar paths of their everyday life. This experience is unsettling and can be irritating, but I think it has great leverage because it is uh, precisely, uh, precisely this friction that favors learning by doing which makes long established patterns visible or burning questions attainable. At the same time, this irritate, this somehow irritation is made, is made expressible and commonly carried through the closeness of the pilgrims in the shared experience. But so the participants of Spiritex outlined an inner movement in the concrete outer movement of the pilgrimage path. They described it as a certain conscience, consciousness raising as an encounter with oneself, which encourages questioning and reflecting on prevailing models of action and thought. This is a quote of some of, uh, the, of one student, uh, the, uh, who wrote it down in the pilgrimage diary. To come to a conclusion, I would like to emphasize one last thought. In pilgrimage with an R project, a new space, and in some cases, cases even a first space, opens up for prospective RE teachers, where existential questions can be raised and discussed in a safe space. And this space, for reflection and discussion is an impulse to reconsider one's own place in the system of the church institutions and to also rediscover one's own authentic practice and religious spiritual way of life in a constantly changing world. So with that being said, a lot of talking, I pass it on to my supervisor, Bert. Yes, thank you very much, Barbara, for your for your excellent presentation of our Spiritex project. I'll I'll, I'll um, later I will share with you a screen with some of the bibliographical bibliographical um, elements of it. Yes, yeah, it's uh, it's um, 
it's it's really a pleasure to connect so to say spiritex as a project that we uh, have been developing uh, on on european soil yes to connect it to to the work of jennifer and uh, to the work on on inhabitants and on the the challenge uh, of um the, the the climate crisis at the other hand so we were struggling a bit to um to find out how we can connect that further but i think there's a lot of interesting stuff uh in in the in the exchange between the two projects and i i especially also wanted to um to um open the the reflection again uh on on those elements of um environmental biographies and uh, and constructive connectivity so the we all have our own biographies where we belong to where we come from yes and how we could keep be connected in a constructive way how the connectivity could could happen and barbara referred to that one session that we had uh, in 2021 in the in the in in the in the middle of the corona crisis in which we we were together with with couples of students. Yes, our students are preparing themselves for for teaching RE in in schools. Yes, and they they did that that pilgrimage two by two. And in the evenings, we connected through Zoom, and we had we we told our stories, we exchanged our stories again in the evenings, and we had some nice impulses as well from other people who were uh, involved in the project. So we we. We rehearsed, so to say, and we re-evaluated, uh, reconsolidated the way during the day in the in those Zoom sessions. So the, the the real challenge is really about how can we in these harsh times we can reconsider um, pilgrimage uh, in a, in an in a um, biographical and in a narrative way at the one hand, but also in a let me say in a constructively connective way. So that's that's the real that's the real challenge, I think. Um, like Barbara was mentioning, it's all about it's all about walking. It's all about the physical act of 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 doing things. You know, it's learning by doing. It's being on the road, yes, and it's being together on the road. The togetherness of the road, the embodied togetherness which makes it so uh, special. And, and then, there, of course, the, the exchange with elements of, of space and ritual and text on the road, yes, um, and how these sources can become resources, like she said. Um, we discovered actually also three steps in, in, that, in, that, in that being on the road. And the first one is always the performance, the doing, the learning by doing. John Dewey would say it's all about learning by doing. So doing things together, yes, being involved in engagement, in, 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 in praxis. It's, uh, practical theology always starts with praxis, yes, with the lived praxis that you do something in the best way also together yes and the second thing is always about storytelling the next step is about telling the story thicken so to say the the experience the biography telling the story like we just did in in the in the breakout rooms telling the story about what we experienced yeah make make a thick description out of it uh, in the presence of each other and the third step could then be um to um to face that interpretation of our journey and that common interpretation from a, from a, from a third perspective, from a, from a significant other who could be a tradition, who could be that could be a tradition, could be a, a scholarship, that could be an, an, a way of looking at the world from a specific philosophical or theological approach. So it's all about doing the performance, telling the story, and exchanging thoughts on what. How we could frame this, reframe this from an, from an, from an, um, a more reflexive perspective. Yes, always these three elements I think that bring us together on the on the pilgrimage, more or less. I think the storytelling is one of the main the main elements, like also Barbara mentioned. So, biographically deepen our so to say our own stories by by telling the story and by by communicatively going the path as a learning path. And by slowifying, like she said too, yeah, it's a, this this is really a countercultural, a subversive act. Slowification in these days, yes. So we were slowified by the lockdown, and people, some so many people said, well, it's good to be slowified, really, and to be aware of myself and my family and 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 the, the important things in life. I think this. This was a good experience for many people yeah, in many ways. Not for all of us. Let us be honest. Yes, some people were also frightened by the slowification. But 
I think in a way it could also be helpful in the learning process in, a, in an educational context. However, there are so many challenges that need to be addressed. And, um, and one of the main challenges is, of course, how shall we, um, by doing so, by, by learning this way of, of behaving, yes, by, by doing a pilgrimage and by being a vulnerable person on the road who has to be um, open to the conversation, has to, be, has to be relying on others as well, has to be receive the gift of friendship, to use the words of, of Hans Reinders, his beautiful expression, to receive the gift of friendship on the road, to be receptive for friendship and for in your in your in your in your um, vulnerability to be receptive for the other so to say how can we how can we we make this also um how can we broaden this also as let me say it in this way as a political act i think this is a political challenge yes. so we we have to bring this kind of vulnerability experience and and slowifying up experience into a more social and also i would say also in a political context yeah as far as I am concerned, is this possible? Is it is it is it a possible way of looking at the world and looking at education these days? How shall we uh, deal with what Mary Hess has been uh, wonderfully calling the the context collapse that we experienced dur during the the, the 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 lockdowns? The context collapse. The collect the, the, the context was collapsing. Was was getting absent we were we were contextless yes and we human beings we need context we need we need um the exchange of being together i i like the screen here very much and i'm so happy that we can do this together but i would like to embrace you much more and and to have real context uh, if you know what i mean uh, being together in in our conversation and in our in our friendships and and, and exchange uh, during the conference yes so how shall we continue that conversation perhaps in you is what is happening to our to our uh, embodied uh, educational acts in this context in this zoom context what what happens to our to our uh, epistemologies actually our 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 learning modes and learning strategies and our epistemic epistemic uh, epistemological uh, ways of looking at the world. So many open questions for us in this project, and uh, I think we we can we can further think on them. So happy was uh, was I with your with your uh, with your uh, presence in this. Uh, I can just briefly um, share the screen with some of the uh, some of the elements of of um, of literature going around. So we some of the of the elements are also available online. There's this beautiful paper by by Barbara, Barbara Niedermann, Religious Identity and the Spaces of Encounter. It's in German, but you're all, of course, you're uh, theologians, you're all uh, familiar with German. <laughs> We're working on translations. There's some, some stuff on, on, on my blog spot and on my website. But some so we're working on translations and we're working on, on, on the exchange in, in, in this. Um, so this is just to mention some of the, of the elements of, of research that we're, we're doing in this field. Yeah, back to you, um, Jenny, Jennifer. Thank you, um, Bert and Barbara. As you can all hear, we have many moving parts in this project. Um, and I think that with the time that we have left, um, we'd love to hear um, from you, maybe going back to the story sh sharing practice, one place to start might be this. Um, of the sites that you shared with each other, were they sites of home, um, long-term um, inhabitants in a particular place? Were, there, were they stories of pilgrimage or places that you uh, were in for a shorter period of time that nonetheless significantly shaped your identities? That's one of the tensions that we um, are playing with in this project. So curious to hear, feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, or type in the chat. We're a small enough group, I think you can just talk. I'll go ahead and chime in to get things, things rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, I shared uh, the story, it's my background here is the the hill uh behind the house where i grew up 
uh, in, a, in a poor rural community, but we had this space and definitely a sense of rootedness there. Uh, if I may, though, it, it also, because it was uh, a, a large area of, of wooded hill and spaces, there was a sense in growing up of pilgrimage, of being able to allow mm -hmm. to explore further and further into that hill and discovering, uh, I shared with my group, the Valley of the Vines, uh, the gravel pit, uh, the what I, I quite the most beautiful place. And those were in a sense an exploration of nature that uh, was in a small way a reenactment of the hero's journey, if I might be so bold as a young person, as a child. Um, but I, I think that's why there's a rudeness that has stuck with me of that space. It wasn't just a static space, if that makes sense. It was an environment that allowed for discovery uh, and, you know, discovery of space, but also, of course, discovery of myself um, along the way. Yeah. Thanks for that. And um, one of the ways in which we can sort of disrupt um, the sort of binary assumption that pilgrimage is someplace that's completely unfamiliar and home is always a place that's completely familiar when in reality, there's always mystery in every place. And, um, and opportunities for that. Um, Lauren has typed in the chat that um, her group, which she also called out Joyce, so <laughs> um, that so the, the group talked about significance in terms of formation, whereas places of pilgrimage were often more connected to significant events. Lauren or Joyce, would either of you like to elaborate on that point? <laughs> go ahead Lauren I have someone yelling for graham crackers in the background so um we might be interrupted it's okay. um so I just thought that was something that was interesting because we all talked about the places where we grew up some of the places where we came from and that formed us gradually over the course of many years um and Joyce was just pointing out which I thought was really interesting that instead of talking about like one significant event we all talked about like this place is significant to me because it was very formative or like very foundational to who I am um and so then we shared a little bit more about some of the places that we went afterwards and some of the significant things that and events that happened to us in those places um and I just thought that was interesting and in thinking about how you know we can all tell stories about events that happen in our places of origin hey can you be quiet for just a second thanks so much <laughs> Um, no, no, I cannot. <laughs> uh, no, he cannot. Um, but that in, in our places of origin, it tends to be more of this like slow and gradual formation, and it's not really tied to any one event um, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This reminds me somewhat of, um, I mean, many scholars have talked about this, but I think about Jim Fowler's conception that like formation happens over time, but there are also these sort of like um, theological um divine interruptions that also are um formative of identity even in their disruptiveness other thoughts i might just add to that last point to one of the um kind of key thinkers on place base or place theory is um yifu tuan who wrote a book called Topophilia. You might have heard of this book, but one of the things he says is that tourism cannot really um, invoke topophilia, that that requires sort of an ongoing living in a place, committing to it and so on. But he says that travel can be really important in terms of the aesthetic embodied immediate experience. And some of the things that Barbara was naming about the slowification and the disruption of our ordinary patterns um, might shape how a person returns to the place that is home and how they interact with that place um, beyond the pilgrimage um, setting. And of course, a pilgrimage is not the same as tourism in the way that Tuan describes it, but um, I thought that was an interesting connection. Other um, thoughts about the practice of story sharing that you did or anything else that you've heard today in our last 10 minutes here? 
and we were in our group we were we were impressed by the idea so we had we had actually uh eileen in our group sitting at the at the beach yes that yes. was her yeah and um, we were of course very jealous yes right but we were uh we became aware of the fact that we were um in telling our stories we we became aware of the fact that we were we were connected through the same earth we were sitting at the same globe mm -hmm. the same earth so to say and we were thinking about water water as bringing us together yes we can we can float on the water and we can we, we could swim we could we could reach each other um we're connected through the waters so we were connected in a way the three of us in in that in that small conversation and we were of course also thinking about uh the danger of water the flooding the the environmental crisis uh, people have to flee away from their homes because the water is, is is getting is raising and and so on and so on tsunamis and so yeah so we we felt the, the 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 gratitude of the earth but at the same time also the the um the danger of being connected in that way and how we can survive together on that on that planet it's very ambiguous in a way yeah thank you for that thank you for that um on this point of um the the movement of peoples um at away from ecological disaster um sort of connects with what peter has typed in the chat if i can peter if you don't mind me naming this out loud the experience of movement um and the the fact that um, I can't remember what the statistic is now, but I want to say one in eight human beings on the planet is um, my understood to be understood to be a migrant, either a refugee or a person on the move. And so this sort of parochial understanding of place can really um, be problematic in that in that context. There are some scholars too that are um, also thinking not about place as a thing or a geographic location, but place making is something that human beings tend to do. And so one example is of um, someone did a study of, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember this, the scholar's name did a study of um, migrants place making in their temporary housing in New York um, and the ways in which they um, made what wasn't their home um, engaged in practices of placemaking. So I don't know if Peter, you have other thoughts on this um, tension between movement and place. I'm glad Dr. Ayers that you named, uh, named that, uh, that idea of placemaking uh, because it is a, a tension with those of us who, uh, who grew up either with, without a, uh, a strong sense of place, something that might have lived in that place, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking especially of some missionary kids that I know, um, they might have lived, lived in that place, but they uh, they did not reach uh, fluency in the local language, or, um, or they might have lived in that place only three to five years before moving on to the next place, and so there are places that they would, they would consider home. You ask them, where are you from, and they don't know how to answer. Um, I'm so, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking about that, and what what that perspective might also add to uh, to the idea of pilgrimage. Because mm -hmm. um, if you if you grow up with, if you grow up either with a sense of places, uh, going to another another place evokes a, or may at least evoke a different kind of experience that may then be helpful in the conversations with those who do have a very uh, grounded sense of a place, um, and who may be experiencing uh, this this place of pilgrimage in a very very different way themselves. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, in some ways, pilgrimage almost it's possible that pilgrimage assumes a static place before the trip is made. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for that. Kimberly, would you like to add anything to what you typed in the chat or? Well, I, I just like the way um, 
um, Peter voice that, you know, identifying with the experience of transition um, as a sense of place, because literally my daughters and I were talking about that. And uh, we were talking about me possibly having to move being, you know, United Methodist and being itinerant. Yeah. And she said, I mean, Jesus was a nomad. He didn't stay in one place. So I don't understand what the big deal is. But um, all that time, I was also really hung up on how the transitions affected them. And if I see it differently as the transitions being a part of them and a part of their, their movement and their formation and who they are, it just makes it completely a uh, different perspective. Mm -hmm. Some of the more recent scholarship on place does take up this challenge. And in fact, um, it, there's also some discussion of the ways in which all of us now are multi-placed um, because of the ways in which information is shared, travel, um, that our sort of digital existence now transcends sort of a very a parochial understanding of a local place, but that like we actually all are always um, between um, and in many places. So um, yeah, thank you for this part of the conversation. We're just about out of time. Bert, Barbara, would you like to say um, something? Any final thoughts? Barbara. No, why not? I will go ahead. Mm -hmm. I will need to think more about this movement thought as well. I really, uh, I really like that one. Yeah. I don't want to do a hierarchy in best thoughts or this uh, evoked something in me. So I want to, to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Being on the move, so to say, yeah, you moved from, from Austria to Germany and then and then you came over to Bonn to to write your dissertation. So that's 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 quite a that's quite a move. And I'm moving from Belgium to to Germany every week, so to say, to teach. Yes, it's it's being a person on the move, but it's not a long distance. But still, it's it's another culture, it's another context, it's another experience. Yeah. So the, this this you called it, Kimberly, the transition, the permanent transition. Yes, that mm -hmm. that's an interesting. I like that word, transition. Yes. The, mm -hmm. Which is can also be a very positive, uh, positive experience, but but sometimes also a hard experience. It's not always. It's very, it's very, um, it's very ambivalent. So I say in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then to create your life out of that, that's that's the, that's the challenge, yeah. yeah. And tell the story, and to remain on the road, yeah. Mm -hmm. Friends, thank you so much for engaging this conversation with us. Um, it's really wonderful to see you all. I wish that we were in person and could draw all of our stories and exchange pictures and all of that um, next time. Um, Mary has posted the link for the um, feedback form, which will help the executive committee um, plan future meetings. So do please let them know how this session went for you. Um, and thank you all very much. We'll see you at the next session.